This man never wrote a book. He never owned a home, never had a family. He didn't go to college. In his adult life, he never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He raised no armies, held no press conferences, signed no treaties, and yet this man has split history in half. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever been built, all the parliaments that have ever deliberated, all the bombs that have ever been exploded, all the missiles that have ever been launched have not affected our lives as has this man. More poems have been written about him, more stories told, more pictures painted, more songs sung than about any other individual in the history of mankind. Today, we discuss Jesus Christ. Insight, the religious principles underlying American democracy, the fundamental connection between faith and freedom. How do you do? My name is Father Kaiser. If you were God and had created the world, would you want to join your creatures and become one of them? If you were God and had decided to become man, when would you decide to enter human history? In primitive times when human culture was just beginning to take form? In the Middle Ages when religious faith was the dominant motive in human life? Or in modern times when man's need for God seems the greatest? If you were to become man, to what continent would you go? To Asia with its ancient traditions? To Europe with its appreciation of the mind? To Africa with its boundless energy? or to America with its marvelous technocracy and its love of freedom. Yes, if you were God intent on becoming man, where would you go? And what people would you make your immediate brothers? Would you decide to be French or Russian or Indian or American? You and I cannot answer these questions. We are not God. We lack the intelligence to view things as God views them. But we are not so dense that we cannot observe the actions of God. We can study history. And so we can see how God answered these questions for himself. From his vantage point in eternity, God looked upon all the ages and decided upon the era of imperial Rome. And he chose to enter the Jewish nation and to have Semitic blood throw, throw, flow through his veins. For this race was his father's chosen race, and they had been especially prepared for his coming. God decided upon the Jewish homeland as the site of his birth, the land through which all the ages has borne various names, Judah, Israel, Canaan, Palestine, or more simply because he lived there, the Holy Land. Situated on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea, the Holy Land is meeting place of three continents. Africa on the south, Asia on the east, and Europe on the north and west. It was then divided into three provinces, Galilee in the north, where the hills were lined with olive trees, and the inhabitants were simple but enthusiastic. Samaria, a roughly mountainous region whose people were anything but hospitable. And in the south, Judea, whose capital was Jerusalem, the throbbing heart of the Holy Land and the living center of the Jewish religion. Five miles to the south of Jerusalem stands the city of David, the town of Bethlehem. It is here that our story begins. Now it came to pass in those days that there went forth a decree from Caesar Augustus that a census of the whole world should be taken. And all were going, each to his own town, to register. And Joseph also went from Galilee out of the town of Nazareth into Judea to the town of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David to register, together with Mary, his espoused wife, who was with child. And it came to pass while they were there that the days for her to be delivered were fulfilled. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds in the same district living in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood by them, and the glory of God shone round about them. And they feared exceedingly. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be to all the people. For there has been born to you this day in the town of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you. 
you will find an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth among men of good will. And it came to pass when the angels had departed from them into heaven that the shepherds were saying to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And when they had seen, they understood what had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard marveled at the things told them by the shepherds. And Mary kept in mind all these words, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, even as it was spoken to them. And when eight days were fulfilled for his circumcision, his name was called Jesus. The name given him by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. The years that follow are well called the hidden years. Saint Luke merely tells us, Jesus advanced in wisdom and age and grace before God and men. When Jesus reaches the age of 30, we're able to trace his footsteps with a high degree of historical accuracy. For it is then that he begins his public life. The great evangelist of the day is his second cousin, John the Baptist, an austere, somber man who warns the people, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Large crowds follow him. He baptized many of them in the Jordan River, some becoming his special followers or disciples. Peter and Andrew and Nathaniel, it is thought, were originally disciples of John the Baptist. It is now February in the year 27 AD. For the next 10 months, Jesus spends most of his time in Jerusalem, the pulsating metropolis of the Holy Land. He teaches in the temple and he begins to work miracles. He first carries his message to the spiritual center of the Jewish nation hopeful that by influencing the center, he would affect the whole nation, he will soon be disappointed. In the temple, he finds merchants selling pigeons and lambs for sacrifice to the poor at exorbitant prices. Fashioning a whip from some cords, he drove the merchants from the temple. This act did not endear Christ to the religious authorities. Up until this time, they had not taken him too seriously. Now, they begin to watch him. The lines of battle are beginning to be drawn. By December, Christ can see that his teachings are not being accepted by the sophisticated Judeans. And so he turns to more fertile territory. He goes back to Galilee. For a time, he teaches in Nazareth, his own hometown. But there too, he is opposed and rejected. And so he settles down in Capernaum on the northeastern shore of the Lake of Galilee. For the next 18 months, he uses that city as a headquarters from which he will travel to the outlying towns and villages. Christ begins to bind certain men to himself in a very special way. This is a time of many signs and wonders. He heals the sick, he raises the dead, he cleanses the leper. His fame spreads throughout the entire Holy Land. Jesus becomes a celebrity. His followers begin to abound. This is also a time of great teaching. Jesus now lays down the fundamental principles of the kingdom he will establish. In the Sermon on the Mount, he gives the church its constitution. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are the patient, they shall inherit the land. Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for holiness, 
they shall have their fill. Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be counted the children of God. Blessed are those who suffer persecution in the cause of right, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and speak all manner of evil against you falsely because of me. Be glad and lighthearted, for a rich reward awaits you in heaven. After the Sermon on the Mount, the apostles, already trained and empowered, are sent out by Christ. They tell the people, the kingdom of God is at hand. Their message is accepted, and the number of Christ's followers continue to grow. Once they try to make him a king, but he flees from them. His kingdom is not of this world. One day by the lake shore, Jesus miraculously multiplies bread and fish so that more than 5,000 hungry people may be fed. The next day he speaks to the same crowd and referring to the Holy Eucharist, he promises to give them his flesh to eat and his blood to drink. He frequently debates with the Pharisees and he already knows how it will all end. To the apostles, he says of himself, the Son of Man is to be much ill-used and rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be put to death and rise again on the third day. After 18 months in Galilee, Christ decides to carry his message into Perea, which is on the other side of the Jordan River. The next four or five months are spent in this area. More miracles are worked during this period. Ten lepers are cured on a single occasion. Two blind men are given sight near Jericho. And Lazarus, who already had been laid in the tomb, is restored to life. During his mission in Perea, the teachings of Christ became even more complete and explicit. And his own statement of his mission became clear. What is the mission of Christ? What is he trying to accomplish? Well, when you look at the statements of Christ, you will find that he intends to do three things. First, he intends to teach. His mission is essentially an educational one. For this have I come into the world, he says, to bear witness to the truth. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light which is life. The entire public life of Christ is taken up with teaching. He seizes every opportunity to talk to the people and deliver his message to them. What he teaches is divine revelation. And what he reveals is God's own mind. You know, you and I, we're curious creatures. We want to know. We're always asking questions. Where did I come from? Where am I going? What will make me happy? These are the questions you have asked yourself many times. And these are the questions Christ answers for you. He reveals the secrets of God's inner life. He tells us about human nature, its meaning and its purpose. He tells us of God's tremendous love for each of his creatures. And he shows us what we must do to return this love and achieve perfect happiness. This is the second aspect of Christ's mission. He comes to guide us to heaven. One day Christ was asked by a lawyer, who is my neighbor? Christ answered. A man was on his way down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell in with robbers who stripped him and went off leaving him half dead. And a priest who chanced to be going down the same road saw him there and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan who was on his travels saw him and took pity on him and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine into them. And so mounted him upon his own beast and brought him to an inn where he took care of him. Next day, he took out two silver pieces which he gave to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and on my way home I will give thee whatever else is owing to thee for thy pains. Which of these, thinkest thou, proved himself a neighbor to the man who had fallen in with the robbers? He that showed mercy on him. 
Then Jesus said, Go thy way, and do thou likewise. Love, then, is the great commandment. It is the way to God. And it explains the third aspect of Christ's mission. He comes to sanctify us, to give us a share in God's own divine life. God, you know, is a family composed of three natural members, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They have a life all their own. It consists in knowing and loving each other. Now, God, in his tremendous love for each one of us, wants to give us a share in his divine life. This is why God became man. I am come, Christ says, that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Christ is humanity's link with divinity. His human nature is not a breakwater against which the waves of the divine life break before receding into the depths of the deity. It is rather a conduit along which the divine life flows into the souls of those who believe in him. Christ is our way to the Father. No one goes to God except through him. As St. Paul says, there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. He is the truth, the way, the life. He's the truth because he teaches us. He is the way because he guides us. He's the life because he sanctifies us. While Christ was teaching in Perea, opposition to him was solidifying in official circles. The Pharisees, the chief priests, and the leaders of the people began to conspire together and they reached a decision. Christ must die. No other way would remove this threat to all they held dear. Why, we may ask, were they so bitterly opposed to Christ? Why did they not accept him? These are difficult questions to answer, but they do have an answer. The authorities did not accept Christ because they were unwilling to accept his divinity. When he employed the powers of God, forgiving sins or dispensing from the Sabbath observance, they were infuriated. The law of Moses, as they interpreted, was for them the ultimate authority. Their interpretation of it was always a rigid and formal one. The Pharisees looked forward to a political and military messiah. They wanted a national leader who would expel the Romans from the Holy Land. The Messiah who said to turn the other cheek and who preached love and humility just did not measure up to their expectations. Jesus was not the type of Messiah they wanted. The religious leaders were also jealous of Christ's personal following. He was very popular. They didn't like that. It could undermine their positions of prestige and power. Already Christ had denounced their hypocrisy. And so their jealousy and insecurity degenerated into bitter hatred. This man must be killed. That's all there is to it. Christ knew of their intentions. He knew they intended to kill him. And yet he deliberately went to Jerusalem. Knowingly, he allowed himself to be captured. I lay down my life of myself, he said. No man takes it away from me. Why did Christ do this? Why does he allow them to kill him? I think there's only one answer to these questions. Christ loves us. And because he loves us, he wants to help us. And at that moment, he knew of humanity's great need, and he moved to meet it. The first two human beings had used their freedom to rebel against God. They had broken the bond of friendship uniting humanity and divinity. And unfortunately, their sin had not been the only one. We have all sinned. We have ratified Adam's act of defiance. And so we have alienated ourselves from God. We have brought guilt into our lives. This is the great human tragedy. Before we can find the happiness we desire, someone must rectify this situation. Someone must intervene to free us from guilt and repair the damage done by sin. Who can do this? Who will do this? Christ can redeem us because he is the God-man. The fact that he has both a human and divine nature superbly equips him for the work of world redemption. And he decides to redeem us. He makes redemption the very climax of his mission. The Son of Man is not come, he said, to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a redemption for many. This is Sunday, Palm Sunday. Christ enters Jerusalem in triumph. Great crowds line the road, pull palm branches from the trees, lay them across his path. They shout, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. On Monday, 
he again drives the money changers from the temple. On Tuesday, he speaks pointedly to the leaders of the people, warning them of the consequences of their decision. But they remain adamant. They meet with Judas, one of Christ's own apostles, and agree to pay him 30 pieces of silver if he will betray Christ. Judas agrees. Christ spends Wednesday in solitude in Bethany, thinking and praying. On Thursday, he gathers with his apostles in Jerusalem to celebrate the Jewish Passover and to institute what is most often called the sacrifice of the mass. After the supper, Christ talks to the apostles as he never has before. He reveals many new truths to them. He prays to the Father for them. Then he leaves the supper chamber, retires to the Garden of Gethsemane, an olive grove just outside the city walls. This is a time of great mental anguish for him. He knows that the leaders of his own chosen people have rejected him. He knows that Judas, whom he had trusted, has betrayed him. He knows that Peter, upon whom he has lavished his love, will soon deny him. He knows that for many, his sufferings and death will be wasted. They will not accept what he is trying to do for them, and so he is troubled. But he prays the longer. He fights his way through to peace and resignation. Father, he says, not my will, but thine be done. By this time, Judas has arrived with the Roman soldiers. They arrest Christ and bring him before Caiaphas, the high priest, for questioning. The Sanhedrin is illegally convened, and during the early hours of Friday morning, a trial is held. Witnesses who have been paid to testify against him are called to the stand, but they contradict one another. Finally, the high priest puts to Jesus the crucial question, Art thou Christ, the Son of the living God? When Jesus answers, I am, they rend their garments. He is guilty of blasphemy. He must die. And so, Jesus is condemned to death. But the Jewish authorities have no power to execute a criminal. Only the Roman governor can do that. They take Christ before Pontius Pilate and demand his execution. Pilate looks into the case and sees no reason why Jesus should be punished in any way, but the authorities are insistent. Pilate fears a riot and so he finally capitulates. He reluctantly consents to Christ's execution. His final words are, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. Jesus is made to carry his cross through the streets of Jerusalem and outside its walls to a small hill called Golgotha. Three times on the way he falls beneath the weight of the cross. Upon arriving, his clothes are ripped off and he is fixed to the cross with nails. The soldiers insert the cross in the ground and Jesus hangs there halfway between heaven and earth to slowly strangle to death. Seven times from the cross he speaks. He prays for his executioners. He asks St. John to care for his mother. He recites the 21st Psalm, and he speaks to the men who are being executed with him. They are thieves. The one on Christ's left begins to blaspheme. He cries out, If you are the Son of God, then get us out of this mess! The other thief said to him, We deserve this, because we have stolen. But this man, he has done no evil. And then he turned to Jesus and said, Remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. Christ turned to him, struck by such candor and faith, and said, This day you shall be with me in paradise. The hours pass. Christ's life slowly trickles from his body and runs down the cross into the earth. It is the end, and he knows it. For the last time, he raises his head and says, It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And with this, Jesus dies.
You may ask, but why was such a horrible death necessary? Wasn't there an easier way? Any one of Christ's acts would have been sufficient to redeem us. Why did he choose this way? I think there are two reasons. First, to bring home to us the terrible malice of sin. If you are ever tempted to think, oh, sin isn't so bad, God will understand. He won't hold it against me. I'm only human. And I suggest you look at Christ on the cross. That is how malicious sin is, that it caused God to suffer like that. Secondly, Christ suffered as he did to bring home to us the tremendous magnitude of his love for each and every one of us. If you're ever tempted to despair, to say, I'm no good, I've done so many terrible things, God couldn't possibly love me, nobody else does, then again, I suggest you look at Christ on the cross. That is how much God loves you, that he suffered that just for you. If there was no other human being alive, if you were the only human being ever to live, God would have done that just for you. That's how much he loves you. And so if you seek knowledge of God and of yourself, where you came from and where you're going, if you are confused not knowing how to live and why, if you are burdened by guilt, and the memory of past sins. If you want a life no bomb can destroy, if you, in short, are living in search of God, then I suggest you turn to Christ and study his teachings. There's only one way to encounter God, and that is in Jesus Christ. There's only one way of knowing about God, and that is by listening to Jesus Christ. And there's only one way of knowing, moving closer to God, and that is by faith in Jesus Christ. Christ is our point of contact with God. He's the pathway to perfect happiness. He is your truth, your life, your love. He alone can lead you to the spiritual fulfillment you desire. Inside is a production of the Paulist Fathers, a group of Catholic priests who serve their nation as witnesses to the religious truth underlying American freedom.